Welcome everyone to the Real Life Machine Learning Conference organized by the team of AI42. And we are now live from Copenhagen, Oslo and Nottingham. And I am going to be the host for the next few hours together with Håkan and Gosha. And before we get started, let us tell you a few words about who we are. Yes, so uh, basically the motivation here for starting the AI42 is because we have recognized that there is no really good starting material. So what we want to do with AI42 is uh, we want to, uh, we are a strong team here consisting of three Microsoft AI MPs, and we want to present you with a valuable series of lectures that will help you to jumpstart your career in this interesting field of data science and artificial intelligence. The concept is simple and involves professionals from everywhere around the globe. Uh, there is new content twice a month that will help you understand the underlying mathematics, statistics, probability calculation together with data science and machine learning pipelines. With this lecture, you are going to be to land your dream job, as long as it's related to artificial intelligence and data science. And by creating cross collaborations with other organizations, we can give the best opportunities to broaden your network in the AI and data science communities. And with the combination of our offered services, we would be able to support less fortunate people and organizations that are not that recognized yet, even though they would deserve it. And we are also very grateful that we have sponsors. So uh, this was our organization and also this conference is sponsored by Microsoft and Miles. And we are very humbled by all the support that we get from our contributors as well. So thank you to Levente Pongor for all the beautiful graphic content. And also it's his birthday today, so we should all say happy birthday to him. And also to Mina Marie for this cool intro music that we have before our events. We are also- Yes. Oh, sorry. sorry just, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, we are also in close collaboration with C Sharp Corner and Global AI Community. So our lectures are going to be also on their YouTube channel and on our social media. Uh, Nicolette Todd creates and reviews all our text content we use on our web, advertised and during our sessions. And you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to become a part of a growing community. And uh, this is where we will also share a lot of knowledge and a lot more fun. And you will find every information that will bring you to an advanced level in the field of AI and data science. You can watch our recorded sessions on our YouTube channel and find our upcoming sessions on our Meetup page. Yep, so this is our first con conference and with this we want to show you how AI and machine learning can be used in the real life. And for this we've invited three amazing speakers here from different industries. So we'll have the opportunity to listen to Stefan Mandaric and he will give us an overview of how AI can prevent in-hospital falls with AI technology. And then you will learn from Goran Vucic, he will talk about how we can use Azure Percept in real life solutions. And then following Goran, we have Peter Larsson, and he is waiting for you with his massive knowledge and experience about real life AI applications and how to build such solutions right from the start. Yes. And before going to our next, uh, the first speaker, I want to share a few information with you. So the code of conduct outlines expectations for participation in our community, as well as steps for reporting unacceptable behavior. Because we are committed to providing a welcoming and inspiring community for all. So be friendly and patient, be welcoming and be respectful with each other. During the real life machine learning conference, you can win some cool things. You can go ahead and complete the uh, cloud skills challenge and in this following two weeks and be the lucky winner of one of the three AI42 swag boxes. The randomly picked winner will be published on our webpage on the 25th of September. And the learners are those who seek out ways to increase their technical knowledge. So this badger is given to anyone attending to an Azure technical session, seminars, meetups, and conferences. So please go ahead, scan this QR code, claim your prize, and enjoy our conference. So 
Let me, or more like Stefan, start on this. Stefan fell in love with data while analyzing terabytes of microscope images for his master's degree. And for the past six years, he has been developing data and machine learning products across startups and global companies. And today he's going to cover some technical and ethical aspects of designing AI systems for medical applications. And in his talk, he will show us how to prevent an hospital falls with AI technology. Technology. And if you have any questions during the session, feel free to post them in the chat and then the speaker will answer them after the session. And if you won't get all the questions answered, we will revisit them during the panel talk or after the conference. Well, at this point, I'm excited enough to let him take the stage from me. So good luck, Stefan. Thank you very much for the introduction. So Stefan, you need to share your screen here. So great. Yeah, great. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. So um, my name is Stefan. I'm working as a data scientist in uh, in Meta Consulting. Uh, my background is in uh, nanotechnology and uh, biomedical engineering. And uh, for the last six years, I've been working as a data scientist, both in uh, consultancies and in uh, startups. So my, my main interests are uh, using uh, data and applied machine learning to solve challenging problems in industry. Um, so those are the kinds of projects I like working with. Uh, a little bit about uh, InMeta. Uh, InMeta is a consulting company with offices in Oslo, Trondheim, and Hamar. Uh, I'm part of the machine learning department that consists of about uh, 20 data scientists with a dedicated focus on building machine learning solutions. Uh, Inmeta is around uh, 200 consultants and we are spread uh, out uh, across machine learning, data insights, software engineering and management consulting. Inmeta is owned by Crayon and Crayon is a global software and services company. And in Crayon, uh, the ML department of Inmeta is one out of five uh, global centers of excellency for machine learning. And uh, totally in the company, we are around, uh, we are aiming to be around 100 data scientists, and we are working with clients, uh, creating products and solutions all, all around the world. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is a product that we are building together with uh, Norwegian hospitals, where we are deploying an IoT device and an IoT solution to prevent patient falls in hospitals. So, uh, in order to give an introduction uh, to the problem, I want to show you a video that's been captured in the middle of the night by one of our devices in a Norwegian hospital. So it's uh, half past three in the night. There's a person sleeping in the hospital bed. Suddenly he wakes up, confused, looking around in the bed, trying to climb over the rails, struggling, being very unstable. And then, uh, several minutes later, a nurse arrives. This patient should not be out of bed, alone without assistance. The patient gets the help he needs and is back in bed. 
And uh, what, what you saw here is actually a really big problem in hospitals. It's uh, patients that need something uh, that are not healthy enough to walk alone, but try to step out of the bed and then fall. This is a, this is a major reason for why uh, patients uh, get more ill in the hospital when they fall. It's also a major reason for why people end up staying in hospitals longer than they need. And it's also a major concern for nurses who have to spend time uh, checking in patients, making sure that they are not leaving the beds without assistance. So with, with that in mind, uh, I want to present what I'm going to go through today. So uh, the, the topic is this issue of uh, patient falls. And I want to start by giving you an introduction to what the issue is, how big it is, and what, what, what is being done with it today. Uh, I, I will go through the hardware side of the solution we're building with the IoT device. Uh, I want to go through the AI part with the data we're collecting and the models we're building. And also, I want to especially focus on uh, what, what we need to think about when, when we are building an AI-powered product that will go out in the field and actually um, provide value in a hospital setting, and how that is different from simply training a model. Okay, so a little bit about patient falls. So uh, the video I showed you, uh, it's actually a really big problem. Uh, hospital falls are one of the most common complications. And uh, only in the US, there are up to a million people uh, that, are, uh, that fall in the hospital every year. And globally, it's even bigger. Uh, consequences can be dramatic. In around one third of the cases, there are patient injuries. It could be smaller things, but it could also be more dramatic things like uh, fractures, internal bleeding, and even death. So for, uh, for patients that are already ill, uh, a fall in the hospital could make them a lot worse. And it could also uh, end up in them staying in the hospital for a lot longer. Uh, this is a known problem. And uh, hospitals are, uh, they have programs in place for uh, managing faults. There are known risk factors. And hospitals are already optimizing how the hospital rooms are laid out, how the environment is and also using other uh, practices to recur, to reduce this occurrence. Uh, but the results are not consistent. Some hospitals have a really good track record, but other hospitals uh, struggle with um, tackling this issue of patient falls. Uh, on a global scale, this is a large problem, but it's also a growing problem. Uh, we have an aging population, and there will be more and more hospital stays, and the hospital system will be more, there will be a higher workload for the hospital system. Um, and in addition, uh, the pandemic has showed that uh, you really want to, uh, in many cases, you want to limit unnecessary uh, contact with the patient uh, due to infections and similar. So uh, a little bit more about what hospitals do today. Uh, every hospital has this on their agenda. And there are uh, multiple fall prevention strategies. It's a multidisciplinary field. It has uh, nursing involved, medicine, and other fields. And uh, typically, there are fall prevention programs in place uh, that are general for all all patients, and in addition, they are tailored to each individual patient. Um, so some, um, some programs include simple things such as having a call button nearby, 
so the patient can call for help instead of uh, going up from the bed. It could be things like uh, making sure the guardrails on the bed are already there. And it could also be as simple as, simple as um, having uh, these uh, slid-proof socks when the patients are walking around. A problem that is uh, very hard to tackle and that also leads to a lot of falls is what is called unattended bed exits. So this means that it's uh, patients who are not supposed, supposed to go out of the bed alone, but for some reason they try to go out of the bed and then they end up falling and hurting themselves. And as we saw in the video, uh, this, this could be hard for the nurses to detect. Uh, the patient could fall and then be stuck on the floor for a long time until someone, someone sees this. Um, and then this especially happens for uh, patients that are uh, waking up after surgery, that uh, have to go to the bathroom a lot, that are confused. So um, patients are healthy or they, they are mobile enough to be able to step out of the beds, but they are not mobile enough to stand safely. So the, these patients uh, should always be assisted when they're trying to step out of the bed. Uh, there are products on the market today to monitor for this. Uh, one very common solution is uh, pressure sensors. So there are sensors in the bed that measure when uh, you move around, and there's an alarm that goes off when uh, the weight is shifted. Uh, another approach is uh, camera monitoring. So there are some hospitals that have systems in place where there are um, cameras in the rooms and someone is watching a screen of this. So there are many, many attempts, many medical devices out there, but um, still hospitals are struggling uh, because none of these solutions are ideal for patients and staff. One very common issue is false alarms. So for instance, these pressure pads, they could go off uh, without the patient really stepping out of the bed. And this could happen um, several times a night. And this could be a real physical alarm that's uncomfortable for the patient that makes nurses run, run to the station. And uh, this is really an extra workload and extra stress for patients. Uh, other solutions are uh, invasive and they're also immobilizing. So uh, the bed sensors and the other measures in place, uh, they result in the patients becoming too immobile and stuck, stuck to their bed. So they have uh, issues with uh, healing during the hospital stay. Another issue is that uh, alarms have really short response times. So a patient that is in a hurry to get out of the bed uh, then you only have a couple of uh, seconds to react. And as a consequence of this, uh, sometimes when the bed alarm goes off, the patients have to run around to check in on the patient, and this is an extra stress. So uh, what, what nurses really want is uh, a bit more time to respond to these alarms, so they don't have to rush all the time. So, um, uh, in Meta, we um, recognized this, uh, this problem uh, with one of our uh, hospital, uh, hospital clients. Uh, and we decided uh, we wanted to use uh, new technology and AI to try to help with this issue. And um, during the development and during this uh, pilot program, we, we set us a couple of goals. So uh, the solution we are building, uh, that one should be built for both the nurses and also the patients. So uh, the primary goal for all parties is uh, to heal the patients when they are in the hospital. It's not necessarily to keep them immobilized in the bed. So we want to build something that uh, reduces the risk of falls, but it shouldn't really interfere with other hospital uh, operations. 
So each party in the hospital, that could be the patients, that could be the nurses, the doctors, the insurance companies, they all have different needs and wants and pain points, but everyone has a common goal of setting up a system so that the patient heals the best while it's in the hospital. And uh, fall prevention should be one of the one of the components that supports this. Uh, so we are not the only ones working with this, and uh, most hospitals have fall prevention efforts in place. So our, our goal is not to come in and replace what is already there, because a lot of things are already in place. But our focus is on adding a new tool that plays along with these programs and then helps the hospitals that are struggling uh, to build successful fall prevention programs. Um, as I said, there is a lot of work in this field, but our initial focus is on these unattended bed exits. Um, there is a lot of research in this, in this field, and our goal is to utilize this research and incorporate it into our solutions and into our models. Uh, there are lots of insights about uh, risk factors that could be included in our model development and operationalization. Uh, in addition, the, the unique thing about AI solutions is that uh, they are not rule defined, but they learn from the real world and they'll learn from the data. So AI gives us a great opportunity to tailor the solution to individual patients and adapt to dynamic conditions and risk factors. So the, these are the goals for um, the products we are building. So um, with that in mind, uh, I want to switch over to the, to the technical parts. And I want to start with uh, presenting our uh, IoT device that we are building. So our idea is uh, built on having a device in every patient room that monitors fall risk and uh, risk of bed exits. Uh, continuously, and then can integrate with systems to trigger alarms and give insights as needed. So on the platform side, there are uh, three main components. Uh, we are using sensors. Uh, our starting point is a 3D camera, and we decided to go with a 3D camera uh, instead of other solutions, because out of everything we investigated, it's the most privacy-friendly and non-invasive uh, way of understanding what goes on in the room. Uh, we are also looking at other sensors, uh, microphones, pressure sensors, uh, pulse sensors, but out of everything, uh, we believe uh, this is a great starting point that combines privacy and signal. Uh, we were also very clear from the beginning that we wanted this solution to live in the hospital room and not uh, on a server in the clouds. And the reason for this is that we want um, our, our uh, data to be processed uh, near where the patient is so that we can have um, good reliability and also have the opportunity to act quickly when it's needed. Uh, so we have decided to go for an uh, IoT device that is placed uh, in the hospital room uh, that, uh, that serves as a hub for uh, collecting uh, all the sensor data, uh, merging them together, and uh, allowing us to run uh, machine learning models uh, right on the device in real time on multiple data streams. Uh, we use a uh, cloud service to organize our fleet of devices. And for this, we have chosen Azure. And we use uh, Azure IoT Hub as our central hub for managing the fleet of devices. And also, we use Azure for uh, integrating with uh, hospital systems and also integrating with uh, notification apps and uh, 
other systems that get the insights and uh, alerting. So um, let's start by looking at the sensor. So um, the sensor we are using, it's uh, something a lot of you are probably familiar with. It's uh, the Kinect. Uh, it's a Microsoft product um, that's available for businesses, and it's called the Azure Kinect. Um, most of us are probably familiar with uh, Kinect from uh, the Xbox. And um, simply explain what it is. It is a um, camera system that has a um, camera that uh, measures depth information. And in the Kinect, it was used uh, for games. So the, the camera could detect your pulse, it could track your hands and your head. And this could be used to, for instance, uh, play games with it. Uh, the Xbox had uh, two Kinects. Connect version one and Connect version two. Um, so it was very popular for games, uh, but at the same time, um, it was also utilized by um, individuals and companies that um, connected to the data field from, uh, from the camera and tried building solutions on top of it. Um, this is actually where our product started. So our initial prototypes were uh, based on the Kinect version 2. And we, we got some promising um, results, but uh, really we struggled with uh, the quality and the resolution of the data. So uh, Microsoft understood this, and then um, they took this technology, they improved on it, and then they released the Azure Kinect. So Azure Kinect is a system uh, that does, does a lot of the same things as the Xbox Kinect, but it's really tailored to industry solutions. So uh, you have a lot of the same opportunities as the Kinect, but it's much higher quality and it's much more comfortable for developers to work with. So, uh, but let's talk a bit more about the Kinect and uh, what it contains. So uh, the Kinect is a, um, it's a device. It's uh, about the size of your hand. And uh, it's actually quite a bit smaller than the Xbox Kinect. And it has a form factor that is much easier to work with. And it's uh, filled with sensors. Uh, one thing that we're using a lot is a depth camera. It's a one megapixel depth camera uh, based on time of flight. Um, that allows us to see what's going on in the room in a privacy from the way. Uh, in addition, there's an RGB camera and also a microphone array. Uh, other things include uh, accelerometer and gyroscopes and also uh, a way of uh, connecting multiple cameras together so you can um, combine several signals from the room. Um, so this, this camera, it uh, runs off USB power and it uh, connects with, um, Microsoft, uh, with uh, Windows and Linux systems and it uh, allows you to hook into the data feed and uh, analyze the systems and run models on it. So it's very developer friendly. So as, as I said, um, what's most interesting about the, the Azure Connect is that it has a really good uh, depth camera. Um, it's, um, and, um, I want to tell you a bit about what this is. So um, in a normal camera, um, the data we get from it is uh, a matrix. So it has an X and a Y coordinates and three channels. So each one of those channels is uh, intensity in red, green, and blue. 
And together with this, we can create an image that's pretty much the same as uh, our ISIS. But uh, what uh, depth cameras do is they give you uh, also a matrix with X and Ys. But instead of giving you three channels with colors, you get uh, one channel. And every pixel is the, the distance from um, the camera to a point in space. Um, so the output is basically what we see on, uh, on the right. It's, uh, we have an X and Y coordinate, and we have a depth coordinate that um, gives us an idea of uh, what's going on in the room. Um, the way this works, it, it's actually really cool. Um, you have uh, in the Connect, there's an IR uh, projector that project, projects a dot pattern around in the room. And, um, and this is, uh, these are reflected, and they are reflected back into the, into the camera. And what the camera does, it uh, me measures uh, the time it takes from the lights to travel from the, from the projector, the bounce off of things in the room, and then go back into the camera. Uh, and this is uh, typically in nanoseconds. So it's uh, really accurate electronics. Uh, and, it, and the result is this um, data that we get that is like a one megapixel image of the room with uh, depth information that's accurate down to the millimeter level. Uh, this technology, um, a couple of years ago, it was really expensive and really hard to use. So this has been done before with uh, stereo cameras. So that's basically two cameras that are spaced apart, uh, similar to how our eyes work. So two cameras that look at things from slightly different angles, and then some logic to create the depths from that. Um, that was expensive, uh, and uh, the devices ended up being pretty big. But in the recent years, um, these time-of-flight cameras have basically ended up being better, smaller, faster than uh, stereo cameras. And now these are part of integrated circuit, circuits. So for instance, if you have an iPhone and you use Face ID, there's one of these cameras that is scanning your face um, when you unlock it. And if you have one of the newer and more fancy camera phones, um, the, the camera actually uses a system like this to measure depth and uh, give you better image quality. So um, sensors are uh, becoming smaller, cheaper, and faster. And in the last couple of years, there are lots of use cases that are opening up uh, as this, this technology becomes uh, available. So if you, if you look into the Kinect, uh, this is an example of the data you can get out. Top left is uh, an RGB color feed, so your normal camera. And the top right is uh, the depth information. So here's been color coded. So blue are things that are closer, and uh, red are things that are further away. Uh, so some interesting things you can do is uh, you can actually map these two data streams on top of each other. So you can get uh, 3D color video by uh, mapping the depth information to the color in the bottom left. And you can also map the color to the depth in the bottom right. This is very interesting and very signal-rich data. But uh, in our solution, we are only working on uh, the depth feed. And we are disabling the color image on uh, the hardware level, level. So it's never connected. And the reason for this is that uh, with the depth information, we get all the information we need to understand what's going on in the room. And also, uh, we protect privacy because it's uh, impossible to identify people based on this uh, data feed alone. So um, the Kinect gives us a raw data feed, 
but it also includes an SDK. So uh, it has a, a built-in model that uh, gives us a skeleton model of uh, body parts. That's uh, built-in that comes with the, with the device. Uh, and this allows us to build um, build solutions directly on the device without training any models on our own. Um, so working with um, depth uh, camera fields, uh, you could either work with it in 3D, but there's also a lot you can do by uh, interpreting it as a grayscale signal and working with it, with it as a simple uh, black and white video feed. Uh, in order to do that, um, what's actually really interesting that a lot of the standard algorithms, um, such as ed edge detection, classification, they work really well on this depth feed. And in our case, um, actually, we could uh, build models better than using an RGB camera because RGB cameras, they struggle with a patient that's under the bed sheet. But with a, with a depth camera, it's much easier to understand the positioning of the patient. But there are a couple of artifacts, and this is something uh, we handle with the signal processing. So uh, you can see that there are some, um, some black areas, and this is basically where uh, the the light signal from the projector gets uh, uh, gets reflected many times, and it confuses the camera. It's also other things uh, such as um, black objects and carpets, or really reflective things. They also um, induce noise. So uh, what we are doing is we are doing uh, we are creating smoothing algorithms and inpainting algorithms to create a much uh, more stable stable signal. And based on this, we have the opportunity to use a lot of the tried, true, and tested uh, machine algorithms, machine learning algorithms. Uh, in order to analyze this data, uh, we are using an um, embedded computer. Um, that is, uh, it's from NVIDIA. It's called uh, NVIDIA Jetson. And the way I like to think of it is if you took a uh, Raspberry Pi, and you connected it to a really, really strong GPU. So uh, what we have here is a small, small, uh, small computer that runs off out of USB power, but it has a really strong GPU where you can do real-time inference on multiple uh, video streams. Uh, it has an ARM CPU and uh, four gigabytes of RAM where you can use uh, simple CPU processing. It has all the connections you would expect from a computer. Um, yeah, and it runs um, Ubuntu, so all your usual programming languages work on it. Um, for uh, in the clouds, we use a couple of Azure services. The IoT Hub is used for manage a fleet of IoT devices. Um, it allows us to monitor if the device is okay. It allows to, us to talk to the device behind firewalls. Uh, and that, that is really important in uh, difficult uh, networks in hospitals. Uh, Azure Machine Learning is the place we use to manage our data, to train our models. And it's also the place uh, where we will build a framework for MLOps. For integrations and business logic, we are using Azure Functions. So that was a bit about the IoT device. Uh, now let's go over to the machine learning part of the, uh, of the solution. Um, so there, there are many, many ways of tackling this, um, this approach. And uh, what I want to show you now is uh, one of the approaches that we're taking, and that's uh, training a machine learning to directly predict in the future when a bad exit will happen. Um, so uh, the problem statement we are starting with is that we have a depth video feed, 
and we want to uh, predict a probability of uh, an event, a bad exit event in the future. So we don't want to uh, predict is this current frame uh, a patient exiting the, the, the bed, but what is the probability of this happen, happening sometime in the future? And the reason for doing this is that uh, if you want an answer now, uh, you can already use a direct camera feed, you can already use a pressure sensor, but there are really no solutions out there that can give you heads up. So uh, that, that's a very valuable thing we can do with machine learning. Um, we are also, uh, in building this solution, we, we are, um, we are setting a couple of performance metrics to make sure that uh, the models we are building are actually useful and will result in a, in a product that people are will, willing to pay for and willing to trust. So uh, for that, uh, the solution we are building, it, it cannot be, uh, so it has to have very low miss rates. Uh, current solutions have, uh, they detect bad exits in 98% of the time. So we, we really can't afford to be any worse than this. Uh, where we have to be better than existing solution is having uh, a lot less false alerts. And also, uh, we want to predict in the future, uh, and we want to predict in a time frame that's long enough to actually be valuable for nurses. Uh, with regards to how we're building this model, um, th this really, um, in academia, this falls into a field that's called uh, video uh, prediction, uh, video action prediction. And uh, for that, there are a couple of uh, known approaches, and we are really basing our solution out of a co couple of these known approaches. So uh, one thing you can do is uh, you can train your model to take in a frame and then predict, okay, how will a frame look like in the future? And based on that, you can say, okay, do I predict that there will be a frame here where the person is climbing out of the beds? That's one thing we can do. Another thing we can do is we can build label prediction. So given, given this video feed, uh, what labels and for what actions am I predicting? Other thing we can do is uh, looking at motions of the, of the patient and then predicting what sort of motions will happen in the future. Uh, each one of these have their own uh, requirements for how we collect the data and how we do labeling. Um, so uh, really the, uh, picking what approaches you want to take are important before you set your strategy for labeling and data collection. Um, so based on this, um, our, our approach, the most promising approach is this uh, predicting future labels. So uh, with, with that in mind, uh, we, we now will look into how we uh, collect and present the data. Um, so uh, for the data collection process, um, our strategy has a couple of goals. So we need to collect, uh, collect enough of the right data. So uh, bad exits, they don't happen too often. They happen maybe once or twice across uh, 100 uh, hospital nights. So our uh, camera rig, it needs to be in the right place at the right time to capture these uh, events. Uh, and we also need to make sure that we have enough data to avoid uh, blind spots and unintended bias. Um, we need to set up a labeling pipeline. So as I said, uh, it's... Uh, 100 nights of nothing interesting for every interesting uh, event. So we need to have the tools in place to efficiently go through a lot of video and identify uh, the, the positive labels we want to train for. And of course, uh, for everything, we need to make sure that privacy is preserved. We want to collect as little data as possible, and uh, we don't want to collect uh, data for uh, when it's not interesting for training. Empty, empty room is not interesting. When there are nurses in the room, it's not interesting. So, so we build our software and our hardware um, to cut out the data that we will not use. 
and also the data that we do, do collect, it's, uh, it's anonymized by default from the camera feed, but we're also removing any associations between patients and room numbers and the data. So it's uh, impossible to track back to who, who was in the room. And of course, everything is stored securely in the clouds. So, um, as I said, this, this happens uh, rarely, and uh, potentially uh, the models are very data hungry. So, uh, collecting enough data has been uh, a challenge and also a very interesting challenge. Uh, we have uh, a couple of approaches. Uh, one thing we did really early was um, just setting up uh, when we started the pilot project. We got consent from um, patients to set up a passive data collection. That means a camera that uh, doesn't do any prediction, that doesn't sound any alerts, but just collects data that we can analyze and train models on. But with only a couple of cameras and uh, not a lot of time for, um, for the pilots, we knew that we wouldn't get enough positive labels. So another thing we did was um, actually go to the hospital and play doctor and patient. So um, we, we got access to a hospital room, we set up a camera, and then we pretended to be patients that uh, Sometimes we're just rolling in the bed, sometimes we're lying still, and sometimes trying to climb out. So this was a way of uh, getting a lot of positive labels very quickly, but also a bit of a dangerous thing, because it was really, um, there could be a lot of bias here, because, I mean, we, we are not experts in nursing, so we, we created some positive labels in how we would climb out of the beds, but that isn't necessarily how a patient would do it. Uh, another thing that is very interesting for us is uh, synthetic training data. So this is not an image of a real hospital bed. It's actually a simulation in Unity. So using this, we could uh, run a lot of simulations in Unity, generate data feeds that we then use to train our models with uh, thousands and thousand hours of data with uh, lots of variations. That was a bit about the, um, the data collected. Uh, with, with regards to, to what, what we've done in the modeling, uh, of course, we are pretty early in this project, so we don't really have a lot of data to do the most, uh, most data demanding models. But what we do is uh, we start with solutions that don't require a lot of data. And one thing we get for free in the Kinect is this pre-trained model uh, that gives us uh, skeletons. Uh, Microsoft has trained this model for us as part of the Kinect uh, in lots of different situations with both real data and simulated data. So they have a very varied data set with a lot of edge cases that would be hard for us to capture. Uh, and this is very promising for, uh, let's call it normal everyday situations. But uh, what we saw does, uh, is that uh, Microsoft didn't really think of this hospital use case. So in some cases, when the patient is in the bed, uh, suddenly the patient is in the roof. That's because uh, the skeleton model gets confused and suddenly there's a skeleton flying around in, in, in the room and uh, you, you probably don't want to uh, <laughs> uh, ship that into production and trigger alarms all the time. So it was a good starting point with um, no data, but we quickly um, got over to a little bit of real patient data and a lot of bootstrap data. And we started building uh, a frame by frame classifier uh, based on a pre trained model uh, that was uh, where we used transfer learning uh, to train it on depth feed. So, this is an example of uh, the model that is uh, binary classification based on a depth image feed that scores every frame with a risk, risk. And using this, we can feed this data into, um, 
a th thresholding and other alerting systems that can trigger an alarm. So, so this approach is, uh, is really promising and uh, actually you don't need a lot of data uh, when you're utilizing transfer learning to build a system like this. Um, so it's a great starting point uh, and it's a model that's very promising to be included in early tests of the device. Uh, but then an issue is that uh, our system um, doesn't really have um, a notion of time. It just takes in frames and it, uh, and it uh, classifies every single frame and then there's some logic on top of that. Uh, so the next point would be to actually use this time information in the videos. Uh, for instance, by connecting uh, the convolutional networks to LSTMs or using 3D convolutional networks to understand the sequence and frames and uh, get a stronger signal in that way. But uh, these approaches, um, they are much more data heavy and they're also more computationally heavy. So these ones are more taxing to both train and also to deploy. On a, on a device. Uh, another thing uh, that's very interesting is uh, actually doing uh, modeling on the 3D point cloud. Uh, so we, we have a depth camera, and the depth camera contains, the depth field contains a lot more information than a single RGB or a gray, gray, gray field that is not captured with normal convolutional neural networks. So um, in the last couple of years, a lot of research has come out uh, on building uh, classification and segmentation models uh, on top of uh, 3D data. That's a bit about the modeling. Uh, with regards to building trust in our solutions, um, this is something that's very important and something we are thinking about all the time. When we build something, how will we, uh, uh, how will the end users trust it? Um, and the, the, the things we are all, always thinking about is, uh, okay, our model accuracy. Do we have a good accuracy? Do we have a good way of uh, measuring this? Um, and um, are we able to convince our end users that we have the accuracy that we're talking about? Um, do we have the right training data? Do we have enough of it to correct for biases? Is there something we're missing in the training data? How stable is the solution? Will it get confused? And if it gets confused, is there some humans that can take over? And also, are we able to uh, do inference quickly enough uh, so that we can sound these alarms when needed? Uh, in addition, this is a device uh, that needs to operate uh, in a hospital environment um, in a stable and good way. So compliance, governance, monitoring is important, data security, and also integration with existing business systems and uh, business rules on top of the model predictions. Um, of course, um, none of this is worth it without um, us having ethics in mind. And uh, fr from the get-go, uh, we wanted to, to design with privacy in mind. And this is something we've seen uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, systems that uh, monitor you and are creepy are um, not the future of AI. And uh, we wanted to design for privacy from the get-go. Uh, making sure that uh, patients are uh, not feeling this is creepy and uh, not being identified in any way. Bias and fairness. Um, how, how will this, will it, uh, will it discriminate some, some patients? Will it work equally well for all patients? And the last thing is, of course, impact. So uh, we are spending time on this. Uh, patients are, um, are uh, volunteering to be part of this and uh, clients will be paying for this. Uh, can we show that there is an impact for this? And can we show that we have a positive impact by the, building the solution? So um, just to summarize, 
um, I don't want to repeat the project, but I want to um, just talk about uh, a figure um, that comes from a Google paper uh, that came out uh, probably at least five years ago. And it's uh, what Google learned when they were building uh, machine learning systems. Uh, so a lot of us are thinking that, okay, machine learning, there's a lot of neural networks, there's a lot of coding training loops and so on. But in reality, what we see is that the, the ML code, it's actually this small box in here. And everything around is uh, the systems that are in place to make sure we are engineering a really good ML solution. Uh, so, so this is what Google says. Uh, and it's uh, something I really agree on from uh, as an engineer. But when I'm building, uh, building a solution that's going out and solving like a real business need in the real world, there's a lot of other things that you need uh, in addition to all the really good engineering. It's things like domain experience, uh, understanding the problem, understanding what works well, what does not work well. How will people interact with this? How do we integrate this and um, get it to work in an existing system? Privacy, fairness, transparency. How do we demonstrate that this is uh, worth uh, investigating further and worth, worth deploying? Um, how, how do we take this uh, fancy system that spits out probabilities and uh, sounds alerts? How do we make end users trust it? And also, how do we adapt to changing business needs? So building AI solutions, it's, uh, it's machine learning in the core, and it's supported by a healthy dose of software engineering and data engineering, but it's really about thinking how do I build a product that people will like, that they will use and trust and integrate it in a good way? Um, and, yeah, and that's, uh, yeah, much, much more than just tra training the most fancy machine learning model and also much more rewarding in my, in my, in my field of view. So that was it for me. Um, are we, do, do we have some questions, maybe? Wow, Stefan, it was really amazing. It was a really cool session. And thank you a lot for uh, doing such a good job. And yes, we do have some questions. Um, so for example, the first question is coming from um, Gabriel. That um, do you also look at ROI as a driver to justify the time effort of exploring an AI solution to tackle this problem? Uh, so, uh, what do you mean with uh, ROI here? Um, I uh, well. So what do you understand from it? It's, it can be something, I think it's uh, probably related uh, because it was asked around uh, when you were showing the, the camera uh, results after the transformation. Yeah, so, so Stefan, I think what he mentioned is the return of investment. How can you look at ah, the return of investment <laughs> as a driver? Mm. Yeah, so uh, I mean, it's... Uh, a huge uh, commercial, like if you think of the commercial side, uh, hospital uh, stays are very expensive. Um, nurses are very expensive. Uh, we, we have issues with hospital systems being stretched. So there's definitely a lot of both like uh, commercial interest in this uh, from, from investors, from clients, and there's also uh, very important from uh, from the ethical side. Uh, I personally, I know a lot of people who actually have experienced this, and it feels so devastating. Like you go to the hospital, you think you think you are safe, but uh, some something as uh, as dramatic as this happens, and uh, suddenly maybe it's a, a routine thing you're in the hospital, but suddenly it ends up being a very dramatic thing. So definitely both the commercial side, 
Uh, also, like outside of Norway, you have insurance companies. They are very interested in these things not happening. Uh, for instance, in the US, uh, <laughs> you really don't want uh, mishaps in the hospitals there. Yes, of course. <laughs> Thank you, Stefan. Uh, we also have another question <laughs> that uh, how far Xbox camera can detect depth? So like, and, and for what depth you would say accuracy is reliable? Yeah, so uh, the specs say from one meter to around uh, nine meters. Uh, and within that, uh, you get uh, like a reliable um, data on probably like a, a couple of millimeters. So with some uh, with some processing, uh, you could do things like uh, measuring, for instance, bre breathing frequency. So that, that's also a really interesting thing. By by putting this camera in in the room, we are collecting. Um, like other signals, not, not only you're moving around, but uh, if your pattern of breathing has changed, and that's also uh, a signal that you're in distress. Uh, and we are starting with uh, Kinect, but there are a lot of sensors coming out. We have time of flight cameras, we have uh, radars, we have LIDARs. Uh, so cost is going down, uh, precision is going up, and I think we will see a lot of solutions built these sort of sensors in the future. Yes, it sounds really amazing and I and, uh, can't wait to see what is coming next in this industry. And, and I hope you will keep us updated with all the news you have. And uh, with that, I want to say a big thank you again for joining us tonight um, because you did an amazing job, really. And we're going to share in the chat in a second a uh, link where you where the audience can also provide the feedback about the session and about the conference itself. So you're welcome to go ahead and do that now or in the end of the conference as well, you will find the link later. And again, Stephen, thank you a lot for tonight. Now I'm going to hand over the mic to our next moderator who's gonna be Gosha and her amazing speaker. Hello. So before we start, I would like to uh, say that we have Code of Conduct and we are committed to provide an upcoming inspiration community for all. So be friendly and patient, be welcoming and be respectful with each other. During the real life machine learning conference, you can also win some cool things. So complete the cloud skill challenge in the following two weeks and be lucky winner of one of the free AI42 swag boxes. The randomly picked winner will be published on our webpage on the 25th of September. Learners are uh, tools who seek out ways to increase their technical knowledge. This badger is given to anyone attending in Azure technical sessions, seminars, meetups, and conferences. Please scan the QR code, claim your prize, and enjoy our conference. And our next uh, speaker, uh, next one is a bit of Azure Precept, which works out of the box with cognitive services, machine learning, and other Azure services as well with our below Goran. He works as a technical manager for Strategic. He is also a Microsoft AI MVP. He works with notable clients like Forbes, The Next Web, and NVIDIA, and so on. Goran is a tech enthusiast. He writes technical blog posts and often shares his knowledge on different workshops and talks. Goran won't be shy to speak up as he is already a well known conference speaker and author. If you have any questions during the session, feel free to post them in the chat and the speaker will answer them after the session. If you won't get all the questions answered, we'll revisit them during the panel talk or after the conference. So Goran, the stage is yours. Hello and uh, thank you. So I hope you can see my screen and the uh, presentation. Um, I will talk about Azure Percept and uh, we will see some uh, real, real examples. And uh, you already gave a, gave a nice introduction to me. So uh, 
I'll just say I live and work here in Sweden, originally from Croatia. I'm uh, enthusiastic about uh, tech. I often go to different conferences and uh, hold sessions, workshops and, and such. And uh, yeah, I would like to share you uh, today uh, more about, uh, about this uh, device. I earlier worked with some similar devices like Azure Percept. Uh, you've seen one in the previous session. It is uh, NVIDIA's Jetson uh, Nano. Uh, I also, some of those projects I did got recognized by, uh, by NVIDIA and such. Uh, so I, I have some experience in that field. And this, uh, this year, Microsoft uh, released the Azure Percept device, and we will uh, we'll have a look at it through this session. So, where to start? Intelligence at the edge, right? Uh, why, why do we need it? Why we need AI on the edge? And uh, like if we look at the world nowadays, we talk about this industry 4.0 and uh, like there is uh, robotics, um, yeah, everything is uh, automatic. We have uh, big data, we have AI and such. So why do we need intelligence at the edge is the, is the question. And uh, usually like in the real world, those are scenarios that we, that we do, that we process some AI models at, uh, specific location and then get the data data points to the to the cloud instead of sending all the data to to the cloud to be processed uh, over there and uh, if we take a look at the example like uh, this is a car as simple as it sounds right but this car especially modern cars already have a lot of sensors in it and every sensor produces some kind of data and especially the modern cars like self-driving cars uh, they produce a lot of data and if you try to search for uh, how much data is produced uh, i can tell you that there is a lot of different uh, sources that you'll find with a uh, lot of different answers uh something uh some examples i've seen is around uh, 20 gigabytes of data per per hour up to terabyte per day and so on but whatever we talk about like it's a lot of data that is produced and now imagine that this data needs to be streamed to the cloud like you really need a big big pipe to be able to upload uh all this data, especially if we uh, talk about like uh, video data, like you want to want to know what's in front of the car, what's in backs, what's on sides. Uh, maybe you need uh, some additional uh, cameras that uh, could tell you what could be seen in a rear mirror like and uh, such. So do you really need like to upload all this data and process it in the cloud? Actually, no, that's why intelligence at the edge. You run model at the edge, process data there, get important data points out, and this is what you get sent to sent to the cloud. Even though, uh, yeah, technologies as five uh, G and so on enable us to to stream more and do do more things, uh, get more data to the cloud. It is still a uh, huge amount of data and don't just focus yourself on one car like you could have a whole fleet of cars maybe you have the delivery service uh, for the city and you want to uh, make it with uh, self-driving cars i know it's a bit stretched but future is future is all, almost there and uh, maybe you're not running it just for one city maybe you are running for multiple cities right this delivery service and you want to know exactly what's going on with each one of those cars so you could do stuff like uh, predictive maintenance and uh, so on and uh, yeah that's uh, that's a lot of data getting to the cloud so we want to be able to process it on the on the spot and just send some data or raise some notifications. 
And Azure Percept, it's not just the device you've seen on the opening uh, slide as uh, described over here uh, nicely. It is a family of hardware and software and services designed to accelerate business transformation using IoT and AI at the edge. And uh, statement that Microsoft gave, like uh, start your proof of concept in minutes, is actually true. This device is really uh, simple and amazing how easy it is to set it up, to connect to the cloud, to try it out and uh, see how how it works. And through this presentation, I will show you the several of uh, my personal projects that I did for fun, just trying out device. And I'll show you a few uh, projects that I did uh, on, on the work, showcasing to different clients or just exploring uh, how this could be used in real life, right? On the following link, you can you can check out more about uh, device, but <clears throat> uh, about whole Azure Percept. But uh, when we go uh, when we talk about device, we talk about uh, development kit, and uh, that development kit, as you can see here on the picture, consists of uh, two parts. One is the Azure Percept Career Board. It's the computer with these two antennas. And the other one is Azure Percept Vision. That is the smart camera. I have it over here. Uh, I hope you can see it on the, on the camera. So it is in this uh, metal, metal uh, case, cooler, right? And uh, has two antennas for, for the Wi-Fi. On one side, uh, there is a plug for the power. It is powered with uh, 40 volts, which means you will not uh, easily put it on some kind of battery, but uh, it's not designed for that as a Raspberry Pi for comparison, right? Uh, but it's really, really strong and powerful compared to Pi. And on the other side, you can see we have a button over here to turn it uh, on. We have a uh, we can uh, plug in the network cable, we have HDMI, we have USB, and over here we, ha we have USB-C, which allows us with the cable that comes with it to connect it with the camera. This is a camera, you can adjust it in uh, different positions as you like. Connector to the camera is under this small, small uh, cooler and uh, yeah, basically, basically that is it. Uh, nice and simple, small, small device. It this uh, development kit can be extended with one additional part, and that is Azure Percept Audio. And uh, this is how it looks like, and you can see it also on the on the picture. It is microphone linear array. It has four microphones over here. And uh, on the bottom side, you have button to mute it. You have a USB where you connect it and you have the line out. So not much uh, over there. You can see on the picture on the slide that uh, how it's connected with this cable that goes to, to this uh, percept uh, unit, right? And um, what, we, what we can do with it is a, uh, <clears throat> this device can recognize the voice commands, process the voice commands and uh, give us some kind of output. We'll see examples soon. So main question that usually comes up is, okay, how to get this device? Uh, you can buy it at the Microsoft store and they will ship it over to you. Uh, I would say I was a uh, lucky company I work for, uh, got invited to a uh, preview of this device. So I got hands uh, on it uh, pretty early. We got two devices. Uh, I'll show you some, some example. Uh, what can be achieved uh, with multiple devices uh, later on. Uh, 
is it worth the investment uh, i would say definitely even if you are a hobbyist it is uh, there are so many uh, great things you can build and i hope through this session i will inspire you a bit not that i'm selling you anything i don't work for microsoft or something i just uh, saying uh, i really like the device and uh, it's worth trying it out and see how nicely it fits into the whole uh, azure ecosystem of services right so we said device and services, right? And uh, we have Azure Percept Studio. So as described, it is a single launch point for creating edge AI models and solutions. So with Azure Percept Studio, you basically define, okay, how you want you prepare your model, you train your model, you publish it to device and execute, and you see some kind of results over there. And uh, what we can do with the, with the, before I go there, sorry, I'll switch, switch to here. And uh, you see Azure portal over here, and I'll show you a bit the Percept Studio, how it looks and uh, how it works. So you can find it over here or you can find it uh, via the search, <clears throat> right? And uh, when you go into Percept Studio, uh, there's uh, interface is pretty, pretty simple and guides you in a nice and simple way to be able to perform uh, different uh, different uh, things. So it asks you like, are you new to AI models? Do you want to see simple applications? Do you want to do advanced stuff? On the left side, this is like an overview. On the left side, you have option devices. And over here, you can see the list of your devices. At the moment, uh, here is only one uh, device. It is disconnected because I just showed you that device, right? And then you also have a list of AI projects that uh, you worked with uh, vision or with speech, and you can check uh, docs, uh, docs documentation and community and uh, ask for the support request, right? If we go back into the overview where we, where we started when you open Azure Percept Studio, you can see tabs over here. So basically this leads you to tabs. You can uh, see demos and uh, tutorials and they are split into two parts where you have a vision tutorial uh, and demo. So you want to work with your camera, you want to recognize something and uh, try, it, uh, try it out. And uh, here you can try the sample models or Simple models will pop up on the side. You need to select your IoT hub and the device, and then you pick pick the model you want to work with, right? And uh, you can also create vision prototype, or you can go to documentation to learn more. Similar with the speech, like uh, you can use this voice assistant templates, and uh, same way you need to define your iot hub where your device is connected select the device currently disconnected we will go through this a bit later select some examples and uh, start start with with that you can also try out the uh, sample applications like uh, people counting vision on edge and there are some advanced tools that you can use azure ml and uh, notebooks like a quick start is over here and look into some other advanced tool. Basically, uh, that is it. Azure Percept Studio is super simple. You, you can create a project just clicking here around and I'll walk you through the, through the whole setup. I'll switch back to, to the presentation. So <clears throat> when I was clicking around, you've seen some simple 
equation models and uh, those models uh, allow you to uh, do this general object detection like uh, finding the common well well known objects you can do people detection identify people live stream you can detect uh, different products on shelves or you can do vehicle detection cars trucks and so on those are the sample vision models that come out of the box. With voice assistant templates, uh, there, are, uh, there are four of them. And uh, one is uh, hospitality, like uh, example of the uh, hotel room equipped with uh, voice control smart devices. You probably run earlier into the different uh, voice uh, devices at home that you you use uh, that you can give commands control light uh, turn on off tv and such so basically this is very similar to that just applied to specific industry like to hospitalities to healthcare like uh, how it could be used if patient is in bed so a patient could give commands to uh, close or open the blinds right to, to adjust the temperature in room and so on uh, there is a warehouse example with inventory and uh, automotive example uh, this inventory example i can show you quickly in a super short demo this is how it looks uh, we were testing that at the at the office you can see the azure percept is uh, here with the audio and you can give a voice commands like okay uh, you see inventory summary of some boxes you can say okay sell all the green boxes device does the processing of the voice commands and uh, action action is taken so you could see now that in a second as the voice command is pro uh, processed there were six green sold i think uh, and uh, now it was filled in with the uh, filled in with the blue boxes at the at the end right so <clears throat> those are the those are the examples that uh, that come out of the come out of the box if we uh, we we had a look at the at the video sorry skip the slides so question is what can i build with it uh, and over here i i wanted to inspire you a bit with my personal hobby projects and also some things that uh, like i said we built in the, in the company so one of the first things that uh, i i want to try out okay how this uh, custom vision works like uh, what can we what can we do with it and uh, i made a small project and wrote a blog post about it in that blog post there is a full walkthrough but lego had uh, <clears throat> released uh, edition of minifigures with uh, looney tunes and uh, i decided to detect the tweety and sylvester to see okay how this works what i need to do and uh, how to uh, get it on device and get some some results so what i did in custom vision is that i created a new project and i defined it as okay this is some object detection in a general domain and uh, for that for that project i added a lot of images taking pictures of this minifigures and other minifigures and then uh, to be able to tell my model okay this is Tweety, this is Sylvester, and there are some, some other mini figures. In Custom Vision, you train the, train the model, right? Uh, before that, if you, if you use Custom Vision, uh, this is how you tag your uh, pictures. So you need to, for each pic picture, mark the frame, okay, where the mini figure is, like this is 
left Twitty on the right Sylvester and uh, other other uh, minifigures are just for example here and once you train the model and <clears throat> you can go back into the percept studio and over there you can deploy model to device so you can click uh, which model you want to deploy uh, deploy from custom vision in this uh, this case like you are selecting the project name and which model iteration you want to deploy once you deploy this to the device you are able to go and see the web stream video and this is how it looks so through the inter interface you see web stream and you can live move your camera camera around try out different minifigures what is detected and such so this is a result of that uh, probably first project i think it was the first that that i uh, built it with it just to try it out how it works so I decided to, uh, if you want, there is, uh, I think link will be pasted in chat if uh, wasn't pasted already. Uh, blog post about it walks you through with the whole explanation from portal going into uh, Percept Studio, the things that I shown. When you open device, you have these options to view the stream that's the web stream right to deploy a custom vision project once you click that you you just need to select the uh, project name and iteration and, uh, and to deploy it uh, there you can also capture images directly from the camera this blog post will walk you through all the all the details how to how to do that that uh, by yourself if you are interested so the next thing i i uh, was building with it i <clears throat> took lego boost lego boost has this smart brick similar to previous mindstorm version of eve 3 there was a smart brick that you can uh, program communicate with and such uh, this one um lego boost already comes with one car that you can assemble and basically i placed the uh, percept uh, on top of it and uh, decided to try out obstacle avoidance how it would uh, work i wrote uh, two blog posts uh, about it first uh, is on hexter and uh, that one shows in depth like uh, how this this was built from the lego parts then uh, training detecting the cones right uh, and uh, how in uh, with use of uh, node.js uh, i got the telemetry from from the device and over here you can see example telemetry what was uh, what was uh, detected there was some cone detected with some cone confidence over 51 percent and uh, basically idea was when a car runs into the into the cone it should start turning and continue its uh, continue the path so this was this was built uh, i would say in a couple of hours pretty pretty simple you can see uh, percept there cones are detected that's camera on top of uh, percepts now it's uh, lego boost is receiving like a turn command and continues with until uh, there is no cone cone in front pretty simple this is front view uh, it's turning you can also have this programmable led on it when it uh, you can turn it uh, green or uh, blue red whichever color you like you can see here placing the cone in front of the camera will turn it red otherwise it's green 
right pretty pretty simple thing you can uh, do for fun i was uh, right picture is actually from perth australia i was surprised that uh, i got rich from australia that someone is assembling my uh, <laughs> my project over there and asking few questions and and details so that was really uh really su surprising uh thing uh, and uh, yeah like i said custom vision defining your custom model this is not something uh that uh, standard detection would uh, detect those cones come with a lego boost you can detect it and try it try it out uh last of my uh projects i haven't wrote uh blog post yet a bit of lack of time in the in the uh lately but uh, i got it halfway uh written uh it is the air guitar and uh, air guitar is concept of playing guitar without guitar itself right you are just uh, showing in the air how how it works and uh, i posted posted video on the linkedin showing how how it works basically what i trained uh, vision for is to detect uh, different position of fingers like uh, g and c chord and to detect the pick and now when i hit the pick uh, in node.js is a small backend that will figure the moment of that pick was uh, detected and it was moved and triggers playing the specific chord that was in that time there c or g i can tell you for difference of grabbing two chords uh, it took over 200 pictures for the uh, for the chord to be recognized so take some effort like most of time uh, with this experimentations you will spend in the custom visions tagging the pictures but that's how it is but that also tells us how the device is great and so simple to just okay once model is trained and ready you just put it on device and you are trying it out it works works great some some things that come out of the box with uh, with uh, those models that we that we have is for example detecting room occupancy this is this is something that we were uh doing here at the office uh showcasing the use case for for the real estate uh, industry because uh if you are able to detect in your meeting rooms like when people are there you could find out some patterns and uh, just heating or cooling system or turn uh, off lights uh, and uh, similar things so this was one one uh, example that we were doing in work and we also explored some of the concepts like okay how this could be used uh, in uh, in industry and uh, with use of two robotic hands like uh, those bolts were placed on specific locations on this this table and you can see all over here is one small uh, custom dashboard at the moment it's visible camera feed uh, it's connected but it's showing from here a camera was placed on the top later on and uh, some other data uh, that is visible here uh, those things uh, come from the raspberry pi so you can ignore that that is the separate from the pi with sense hat but over here what was detected with azure percept you can see that we detect bolts that are placed those three are placed on correct locations and this one is misplaced so it's not sitting at the location it is supposed to or here right so if we uh i can show you the quick video about it just a second here is my uh colleague preparing to to set this up and uh, you can see robot hands they are placing placing uh, bolts on the specific locations and later here you can see this this detection happening this is this one is misplaced those are three now correctly placed bolts right 
could be could be useful scenario for the for the industry uh getting back to presentation <clears throat> and going step back to that room occupancy example so how do we actually analyze the room occupancy we have the azure percept device at the moment here is only camera but you uh, <clears throat> there is uh, there is device over here that streams data to to iot hub we've seen that example of uh, telemetry i i showed you in the example so data is streamed to iot hub so how we can use this data we can connect stream analytics to the iot hub and for example we can stream it to power bi and i will show you how that is done so when we uh when we uh, want to do this uh this kind of project we can use the standard model people detection and publish it on the on the device in few seconds you can get it running and see that uh, there is a, there is a detection of people happening in front of camera and whatever is detected is streamed to your iot hub where device is connected so in order to stream data we need to create a new stream analytics job so we defined it uh, via the name subscription resource group location and so on once you define the stream job you need to define where data uh, comes from and where will it go so input and output in our case on the left side over here we would define input as iot hub and enter the values for our iot hub and for output we would define power bi so data will be streamed uh, will be streamed into the power bi once we define input and output we need to define okay uh, how this job looks like and what we are actually doing so we define this with uh, with this uh, sql kind of language where we select uh, from our stream input into stream output we define some uh, conditions like neural network is not null so some kind of detection happened right and uh, we are getting the array length because it's people detection it's giving us uh, either uh, no detection one or two or three how many people are in a room and uh, gives us the detection and send this data to to the power bi in the power bi you can create a new report and in then that report you can select the data from the table over here you see i have power bi percept table with some person count and with time because i need to know when this detection happened and over here you can see some detections that were happening like from uh, one uh, to this is two right and i think if i see this correctly this is like over some three minutes tuning this a bit uh, you can adjust it into real power bi dashboard you can combine multiple uh, data sources and such we have like uh, four meetings uh, meeting the rooms uh, that are displayed over here like where we put this device on top of tv and uh, as i said we had uh, two devices so we did two by two rooms to to combine the data to to showcase how it could work and then we could group group the data and show when the meeting rooms are actually used and how many people are using them and based on this uh, we could for example see maybe room two is not used before noon so that means there's no need for heating or cooling over the summer right uh i can show you uh show you quickly that example uh, over here in the 
on the link you can find the full explanation how it works with additional uh, additional details how everything is uh, created and how to make solution of your own and uh, here you can see this is a room that meeting room that was uh, sketch in Power BI, Azure Percept sits on top of TV and what it does uh, over here it detects when someone enters the room and you will see that detection happening uh, now in a second. Here for example I'm entering the room right and uh, there is person person detected. So uh, that was it for me. Thank you very much. Uh, feel free to connect and uh, feel free to ask any questions. Thank you, Goran. It was really, really great to listen about this AI and IoT together. I really enjoy all the things and that you can use Azure Stack and you don't need to write any Python code and use a lot of data science. So I have a question to you. Can you use Azure Predict Studio without Azure Predict devices? Azure Percept uh, Studio. Uh, yeah, uh, you need you need device to connect there to be able to deploy because uh, as I shown, there's not much uh, to be done in Studio. Uh, everything, mm -hmm. if you want to do some uh, custom detection, you prepare the model in uh, custom vision. You can do that without uh, device. You can take pictures with your phone camera or something or uh, a computer camera and you can test it over there, right? Mm -hmm. But once you have device, then you go into the studio and only thing you do, you connect, uh, uh, connect this device and say, deploy this model to device and it does detection. Yeah, because this what I'm thinking is to just start as cost as as costless as possible and just try this one before you buy a lot of stuff. And a lot of people really enjoy your presentation. And Thank if you will have more questions to go around, we have a discussion panel after a Peter session. So feel free to just write more questions and we'll happy Goran will be happy to answer them. For sure. Thank you once again for the really, really great session. Thank you. So I'm going to give now to Hokon and our next speaker, Peter. So uh, welcome back again here. So before we before we start here, I would just like to remind you that we have our code of conduct. So this code of conduct outlines the expectations that we have for participation in our community. And uh, there are also steps that you can take if you want to report unacceptable behavior. So we're committed to providing a welcoming and inspiring community for everyone. So be friendly and be patient, be welcoming and be respectful with each other. I will post the link to our code of conduct in, uh, in a short while. But in addition, uh, in addition to this, we also have a real life machine learning challenge, a cloud skill challenge. And if you participate in this, you can win some really cool things. So if you complete the cloud skill challenge in the following two weeks, you will stand a chance to be a lucky winner of one of three AI42 swag boxes. So we'll pick a winner randomly among the people who have finished this cloud skill challenge, and then we will publish it on our web page on the 25th of September. And we'll also share this with you in a short while. And then finally, we also think uh, that um, uh, we want to celebrate the learners. So learners are those people who seek out to increase their technical knowledge. So we have a learner badge uh, for anyone who's attending an Azure technical session or seminars or meetups. So please scan this uh, QR code and claim your prize and enjoy, enjoy the con conference. So with that said, I would like to introduce uh, our speaker here, uh, Peter, Peter Larson. Uh, 
So Petr Larsson is an entrepreneur and a visionary business developer with almost 20 years of experience from data and AI. Uh, so he's been working both in startup, in research and in large enterprise environments. And over the years, he has gained a lot of experience from multiple industries, both in, in healthcare, retail, in manufacturing, in finance and in the public sector. And he has also been responsible for deployment of exciting new applications that can range from both demand planning, predictive maintenance, recommendation engines, IoT, and also digital twins. So today, uh, Peter will present how Avanade can help their clients becoming more data-driven through some exciting real-life applications. And as always, if you have any questions during this session, feel free to post them in the chat and we will answer them after the session here. So with that said, uh, I will add your presentation here to the stream and then I just hand it over to you, Peter. Thank you so much. And uh, it's a very big pleasure to be here. Um, is, can you guys hear me and can you see the screen? Yes, we can hear you and see the screen. All right, perfect, perfect. So as I said, it's a pure, pure pleasure to be here today and talk about how AI applications can be uh, deployed in real life. And with end in mind uh, from the start, uh, there that's uh, we can almost guarantee a successful deployment, go moving away from so to say, pilots to actually scalable deployments. So without uh, further ado, I will uh, continue the presentation. Uh, it will be a little bit different than the previous uh, speakers, which have been fantastic. Fantastic! Uh, big applause to you guys. Thank you for that. Extremely interesting, I must have had. Uh, today, I will go through a couple of things. Um, that is uh, why people are investing in AI today. And not only people, but the, the large enterprises. Why do they want to become a data-driven enterprise? And what are the challenges in scaling the AI applications? AI strategy, do we have any tools that can help us in order to make a scalable deployment a success? And also, of course, uh, the thing you probably want to see the most uh, some real-life AI applications. Uh, I have them, as you can see, in the last part of my session. So you, so I'm guaranteed that you will listen to the first four bullets. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you for the introduction. So I don't need to uh, bore you guys with that. So I will skip this part uh, and then go into why become a data-driven enterprise. So there, there, there are a couple of things on why we are where we are in terms of uh, companies investing in AI. When I started out uh, somewhere around 2004, and I, I bet Goran also can, uh, can bet on this, uh, is that no one knew about machine learning or, or AI. Uh, and when I talk about no one, I mean, of course, the CEOs, the senior management, the stakeholders. And it it's, um, the companies today, I mean, why are they in business? They are actually in business, if you are very clear, they are in business to build shareholder value. And what I want to show by this picture is that the easiest way of, of doing this is to invest in, in, in AI, in getting data uh, accessible, and of course, in different machine learning uh, capabilities. Um, and as you can see in the picture on the, here, uh, there is, uh, if you want to be successful and basically not die out as a company, you actually really, really need to invest in becoming data-driven. Um, there are a few forces in the making and drivers that, that are uh, main focus for companies to become data-driven. One of them is to increase customer experience. In the past, Companies have been very organizational centric, meaning they have put the organizational structure and producing products uh, as number uh, as the most important part. They produce products that we should buy. Then we have developed to a more customer centric focus, meaning we try to understand what is it that the client want, what the customers want, 
and based on different um, quant qualitative analysis, we have uh, tried to uh, adapt our, our offerings or products to the client and to the customers. And most companies are in that area today still. In the future, and actually a lot of clients and customers who I'm working with today are already in this end, the embedded customer experience, meaning that today customers, uh, business uh, consumers, uh, as well as uh, business to business companies are, uh, are, on, are working and are uh, experiencing different um, needs and uh, on different platforms, on social media, of course, uh, and and so on. And all of this, this the, these different types of systems that they engage in and platforms and so on, create a lot of data. And in order to find patterns and understand the customers and what they want and also actually predict uh, who wants what and when and what actions we need to take in order for them to to actually understand that uh, uh, um, receive what the, what we want to provide is through using ai and machine learning um, <clears throat> another driver is becoming is to increase the operational efficiency um, the operational efficiency is you usually looking at the different processes internally in companies. It meant it's the manufacturing process. It's, of course, the, the production. It's, it's uh, uh, purchasing, uh, procurement, um, and, of course, sales. Uh, how can you increase uh, the, the efficiency within the company? Can you automate? and so on. So automation is a big, big part, of course, for every, every company today that wants to dr become data-driven. I will go into this in the, and I will have some um, uh, refer uh, not references only, but uh, client cases that I will show that uh, are, are to the point on these two topics. And also on this topic, actually, which is the th third biggest driver, and that is innovation. Companies today want to want needs and wants to innovate and and to to stay relevant with clients and customers. To to, to they want a lot as you have all of us in on this call probably know is that uh, our buying behavior is changing a lot. We are moving away from selling pens to selling stories. And how do we do that? Or, or uh, from cars to, to subscriptions uh, uh, and travels. So and in order to do that, we need to use data in order to innovate. And before, this haven't been uh, actually so much possible because, I mean, the, the cloud is actually driving a lot of this, of course, uh, because there is so much data that is needed. And... Uh, unstructured and it takes forever to, to uh, calculate and process but now we can actually already do it and I know that all of you guys on this call you know about this but uh, it's important to set the scene a little bit for where we are going in this um, in this in this uh, presentation uh, <clears throat> so the three drivers are increase customer experience increase operational efficiency and drive innovation and basically, we do this in order to not die out as a company. What are the challenges in scaling AI applications? I mean, are there any challenges? Yes, of course there are. Um, and there are many. Uh, as you know, um, many pilots uh, never become full-scale deployments. Why we don't see so many, uh, so what I'm trying to address here is why we don't see so many uh, real full-scale AI deployments in the, in the real world, so to say. Um, and the challenges, if I put them on a high level, is that there is a lack of end in mind when doing pilots today. And when I say pilots, um, I mean, the, uh, 
we're talking about MVPs, we're talking about uh, POCs, uh, proof of concepts, that is uh, prototyping. And uh, it's, it's uh, companies are using these different uh, synonyms, which are not actually synonyms, but they are completely different things. But uh, in almost every company I come in, uh, they are working the same uh, or doing the same mistake. They found something fantastic uh, and they want to see if it's possible to actually get the output that they are looking for. But usually, and, and usually they actually do, but they can't move away from there because it's too expensive. They have used technology that is not uh, in, in, uh, in, in par with uh, what the IT department wants to work with. They use a uh, programming language that no one knows except the probably, probably the, the consultant company. But there are also other things, uh, which is the internal politics. Uh, if you have an end in mind when actually going into a pilot or an MVP, you are looking at, okay, what, if this is a success, what do we do with it? Why do we do this? If, if, we, if we are not looking at doing this in full scale, if it's a success, why are we doing it at all? However, uh, I know there is this balance, or not actually balance, uh, between exploit and explore. In my view, companies need to explore a lot more than they exploit, of course. But it's, it's, uh, it's, there, there has to be some kind of balance there. And if you don't have end in mind, uh, you will have a hard time setting the scene for full scale deployment. So, because there are people, there are politics, there are processes, there are way of working, and, and things like that, that uh, taking a shortcut, not taking those into account, actually uh, provides a big problem and a big challenge. So, have end in mind when you do this, do the pilots. Then we talk about the people, process, and technology. And that's, I mean, management consultants. Uh, when, when 2014, something, 15, when we started to talk about the digital transformation and, and becoming data driven, there were a lot of uh, clients talking about uh, we need, the, the, yeah, you all know the pyramid where we have people, processes, and technology. And no one then spoke about data because the management consultants actually didn't know so much about the need for becoming, uh, uh, back then, digital transformation was the buzzword. Data-driven came a little bit later, uh, and then they adapted. So now, thankfully, most clients, most companies have understood how important it is with data. I mean, without data, we can't do what we love, right? We can't do our own models. We can't experiment. We can't prototype. So uh, we need data, and that's that's where we are today. Uh, a lot of big, big, large enterprises are trying to get data uh, and make it accessible for people, uh, fantastic people like yourselves, um, data scientists uh, and machine learning engineers, and so on. Uh, and th I think that is great. That is so great. Uh, <clears throat> then we have friends. What do I mean by friends? I mean, basically, uh, third parties, like suppliers, partners, interest groups, and owners. Most of these have something, they are involved in your pilot, and they are involved in, your, uh, in scaling your AI application. Uh, and it's important for clients for, uh, for companies to choose partners carefully. Uh, I mean, there is a trend working uh, of um, working closely together with startups. And I think that is extremely, uh, extremely good. Uh, coming from startup, the startup world myself, I think it's a best way of being in the forefront of things. Uh, however, I also know that there is a problem if you want to if you want to grow, if you want to scale, uh, you can't put all eggs in that basket. And 
they also tend to not work so much with the uh, <laughs> old technology that, that that the big company is working with, with the IT, what the IT department is working with. Uh, so usually there is a discrepancy, or it it, it becomes a discrepancy. Uh, but uh, have, uh, there is, in my world at least, there is room for both both the startup uh, uh, flexibility and the scalability of, of, of a company like for, uh, the company I, I represent today, Avalon, for example. Um, and I think a, a, a sm small clients work with both of these in a good balance. And um, uh, yeah. Then there are some do's and don'ts, just to trying to be very clear here. Uh, and in mind, we have talked, we touched base on that. Basically, what should we do if it's a success, right? Then a success criteria is super important. Usually, uh, that is a little bit oversighted. Uh, don't, it's not defined clear enough. Um, at Avanad, we have actually, uh, because of that fact, we have developed uh, something we call a value tracker. Uh, which is uh, looking at the business value that we are trying to get uh, and see how well we are, are, are uh, delivering on that or in, through the entire uh, pilot. And then, of course, there is a, a plan to scale. Uh, of course, adopt technologies that scale. Um, maybe you shouldn't use, for instance, MATLAB, which is working really great, uh, but there are not so many companies that will use that when scale when scaling. Um, I'm a big Python lover, but um, and uh, I, I'm sure most of you are as well. Uh, and I would say not to uh, programming language that that's that's very good on. Uh, so it's uh, uh, there is a gap there that needs to be addressed uh, early. I would say. And of course, we are talking about the user interface, uh, not the user interface so much, but the uh, interface with existing systems. Uh, it has to be able to speak uh, really good and really well with the internal, uh, with existing systems. We've been covering the trusted partner thing. Um, communication. Uh, there have been several um, engagements where uh, the company have Big companies have started off doing things, uh, and they haven't communicated this. They haven't landed this internally. So actually, people get afraid. They get afraid. This AI thing is going to take my job. So they, 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 usually it's the middle managers that gets very, very afraid because of what I just said, losing the job or lose control or um, lose, lose their uh, power basically. So, uh, in, in order to make them, because they sit on a lot of domain knowledge usually, in order to get them invested and, and inspired, it's very important with the communication part, the education, and the, the training, and so on. Uh, otherwise, you will never be able to change the behaviors of thousands of people, which is what a, a scalable uh, AI solution. Many times have to have to have to do. Uh, I've been covering the don'ts basically. Uh, launch an AI pilot to see if it works uh, is basically the opposite of end in mind. So yeah, and uh, the things that we should look out for are the back black boxes. Um, you, actually, uh, some years ago, I must admit. I, I told clients that they sh actually shouldn't they shouldn't care so much if 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 the if the model performs better than and we can validate that uh, they shouldn't care so much they take the result and be happy uh, but today uh, I think it's so important that we actually uh, have to have some kind of very good explainability of the models we we, we produce. Um, and now, when the EU Commission is putting a proposal in place uh, on being, that we have to 
I think uh, th there will be uh, um, less lock-in effects and less black boxes uh, around the world, at least in Europe. Um, bring IT with you. One of the coolest things with helping companies become data-driven and do these kind of pilots and do these kind of projects, to me, that is building the bridges internally with, with the clients because you have this uh, <clears throat> cross-functional teams that are, uh, before that was a word, uh, that happened. And uh, you sat down with the IT, you sat down uh, uh, with the business that wanted to do something. IT, we need IT to bring the data, we need IT for this and that. And uh, it really built bridges internally. And uh, this silo-based uh, things that have been for so long, I think a data, a pure data, a really data-driven company have very few silos uh, still. But the the, more, the legacy companies, of course, do. I mean, hell, even we do. Um, then, do we have any toolkit for success? In my mind, that is what I call an AS strategy. Using an AS strategy is helping you guys, you clients, to actually prioritize between your, uh, your use cases. In this previous slide, on the below button from the don'ts, I say don't choose the toughest, most obvious use case. Um, maybe you shouldn't try to, you know, uh, for, for instance, in healthcare, a lot, a lot, a lot of, um, or most cases are looking at uh, predicting cancer, predicting um, stroke, uh, or, or something similar, right? Uh, looking at the uh, operational part of it, uh, the surgical part of it. And that is, that, that is the toughest thing you can do for several reasons. Of course, the, 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 the validation process of those models are huge. Um, and also, um, who, 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 who will, um, it's the same with the car. Who will rely on a computer, uh, in, ter computer in terms of uh, getting the right treatment um, and so on? Uh, and there is the legal issues and so on. So uh, in healthcare, uh, they, they would have come a lot far further in terms of AI uh, deployments if they have looked internally to actually use machine learning to optimize processes instead. Um, I would could give you a lot of fantastic examples of that, but we don't have time. Uh, in terms of a strategy model, a tool that works really, really well is something I, I um, developed together with uh, a few professors uh, when I did some research uh, during five years on how companies should become data driven. We call it the data science delivery model. And what it does is actually it discover, helps you as a client to discover use cases. It helps you to understand the complexity of these use cases uh, using what we call the four forces of impact. And then also uh, via the use case matrix, you get a very, very nice visualization of which are the low hanging fruits, which are the ones that we should go for, which are the ones that are require uh, a lot from the business in terms of organizational uh, reorganization. Uh, and of course, then uh, we can establish a roadmap for the AI initiatives. All of this sounds logic, I would say, but it's not, um, mainly because it's, it's, it's big organizations or very complex organisms. And also, they, they get uh, a lot of information from different consultant companies. Uh, this best practice method with a very, very cheesy name, Analytics Jumpstart, is a, a best practice method that is published. It's based on a crisp DM, which is data mining, and is um, wherever we have used it, 
it has been very, very successful. What, what it actually aims at is to understand the different, uh, the, 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 the define, uh, define uh, the business needs and the business value you are looking for. And also very early understand if the data can actually deliver on that expectation. Then you start to prioritize between the discrepancy between the data and the business uh, value that you want to achieve. Then you start the modeling, you start in, in the evaluation. Usually the evaluation process here is a pilot. Um, and, uh, and then you can deploy it full scale. So a couple of AI applications in real life. Um, I've chosen three at this point. And uh, uh, yeah, without further ado, so this is an AI for innovation at a leading accounting firm here in Sweden. Uh, they had, um, when we started working with this firm, they didn't have anything actually. They didn't have, they didn't have even reports, BI reports. Uh, so it was a big journey, but an extremely fun one. What they wanted, even though they were the leading accounting firm, they still are, um, they wanted to move uh, or, or they wanted to use data to um, increase the customer experience and be better at giving them advice, uh, at detect um, certain important uh, patterns that can occur. So they have this amazing data set actually from around 50,000 Swedish companies that are updated daily in terms of economic uh, information. How the, the, basically the, 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 the company finances. And uh, so we started to look at this and actually from the beginning, it was, uh, it was uh, uh, we wanted to understand how COVID had, had um, what was the impact from COVID in different industries on the, in different sectors and, and so on. So we started to look at, okay, can we, can we actually go do like this? Can we get, understand the unemployment rate? And uh, can we make industry comparisons? What is the ripple effect if a company goes bankrupt of this size X or of this size over here? What is the ripple effect of that? Um, and what, when countries delivered uh, crisis packages uh, to, to big companies and, and, uh, and so on, what effect did they have? And what were the ripple effects of that? That was, that was what we wanted. But because of COVID, for some reason that I I'm actually don't know exactly, when we started to look into the data, doing the data understanding, uh, following the, the analytic jumpstart method, we understood, we saw that uh, you guys don't have any data from the last six months, basically the COVID time. So, okay, what we will, will we do then? But you actually do have what we found out is a lot of the other interesting data from prior to that, but it's not COVID questions, COVID output that we will get. Uh, okay, so what can we do now with that data? So we looked at looked at it and we could understand, okay, we can get very interesting KPIs and insights on a country level, on an industry level, and also on a corporate level. And using that, we could do some performance analysis and risk analysis and expansion analysis. And using these type of um, ideas, uh, we could help them create new business models. Of course, all of this is done very much together with the client. Um, and and uh, we came up with something really interesting. Of course, um, I mean, one of the things was uh, to detect bankruptcy, the risk for bankruptcy. Um, another one is what are the, the, you know, the detailed factors that uh, are different uh, for successful companies and, more, and less successful companies? And that was super interesting to, to be able to, all right, uh, we can actually build a service on this 
So uh, they are now looking to uh, scale this uh, and deliver it as a service to clients, uh, meaning that uh, one, you can, you can help you as an advisor, we can help you to understand what factors you need to uh, look at in order to move away from being, uh, have a very poor margin to, to increase your margin. Or as in this case, where do you want to do your next expansion? Uh, in what area of Sweden and so on. So a very interesting uh, new um, service from, from them. Here, <coughs> completely different. We are using IoT uh, and digital twins in order to uh, create the most, the smartest building in Northern Europe. This is in Norway. And it's a huge, it's 80,000 square meters uh, office building. And uh, uh, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's fun. And uh, a lot of things, <laughs> as you can see here. Um, this is the device landscape overview. So you, as you can see, there are a lot of different uh, logos on this here. All of these logos have a stake here. Um, you have parking. As you can see, you have like, you know, toilet paper stuff. Um, here you have lighting and so on, and electricity, of course. So all of these are different types of integrations we have had to do in order to create um, a representation of, of this huge building. And um, we have used a use case approach, so we are right now in the in the in the moment of um, looking at the energy consumption uh, and also parking. Um, so the idea here is to you know build a lot of services around this office building. So if you have a car or if you have a bike or whatever, when you you should you should actually be able to basically directly go to your parking lot. Uh, or where you need to park your bike, etc., and um, a lot, of, a lot of other stuff internally in this building, of course. Uh, I think a lot of you guys are interested in the technical design of, of a thing like this, and it looks a little bit as uh, like this um, <clears throat> design here. Uh, as you can see, we use data factor for move data. We um, we use uh, data lake store for storing data for uh, more uh, reporting purposes, but blob for the the the, um, the, the more uh, un, unstructured data and semi-structured data. Uh, we have Event Hub to keep track of. Um, the different, uh, different streams here for uh, stream analytics. And uh, we use Power BI as the dashboard for a dashboard uh, tool. Um, I will continue. So the digital twin representation, it look a, li a little bit like this. So we have a BIM model um, and a BIM, BIM supply we are working together with. Uh, and what we have done is to make that uh, a representation of that, basically, that looks like a little bit like this. I am not the expert on this, so I will not uh, try to be. Um, but what we can see is that you, we can go from a very, very high level into an extremely detailed level and understand, for instance, the 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 uh, the energy consumption in a certain room, or how many people are in a certain room, um, uh, in order to be able to, uh, if there is no no people in a room, the light should go out. If there are people in the room, uh, depending on how many, it should be X warm, or or we could lower the temperature, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and that also goes for how warm it is outside. Uh, or, or, or cold outside. Um, and the same thing here goes for the parking. 
going down to an extremely low level in terms of uh, where the where there are parking lots, of course, um, but also uh, sorry about that. Uh, I will move quick. <laughs> hold, hold on, I will put on my. back <clears throat> then we have uh, an international brewery that we work with and they wanted to use data and AI in order to come up with a smarter sales process there's not so much I wouldn't say innovation but definitely automation and smartness involved using custom uh, computer vision and a virtual agents as well uh, first of all, we have the, what we call a cell shelf image recognition. Uh, this here is um, <laughs> what it is, is actually that uh, before the sales representative needed to go around with his uh, pen and paper and write down what was uh, missing, basically. Now, using his phone, he will be able to just take pictures, both of the shelves in the store, but also of, of the uh, shelves in the, yeah, as you can see in the, in the storage room. Uh, and uh, it automatically will detect what type of SKU, SKU that is gone, meaning article, uh, and how many that we need to replace them with, or how many we need to reorder. Uh, we can also see how, uh, or they can actually also look at um, the in the store, the, the competitor aisle, so to say. How much space does the competitor have? Uh, and, and all of this is al allowing them actually to become more of an advisory sales representatives than traditional sales representatives. So they're just want to okay here, here's what you lack uh, let me provide you in, with an order so here you actually can both gain efficiency you can connect with the client in a or the customer in a much better way being the advisor uh, and uh, of course then also uh, you can work offline as you can see here <clears throat> uh, the flow of this is that you Prepare the visit. You go to basically to, to the to the visit uh, to the store. You do the outlet execution using the shelf image scan. And then you get the validation, and I think it's very funny that it's a red cross here that the picture didn't go through. But yeah, uh, interesting. Uh, and then uh, we have a shelf measurement. Um, basically, that calculates the market share of Heine, uh, in this case Heineken products. Then, then we have a Power BI report, a dashboard uh, that the sales representatives are trained to understand, and they can use this to show the the clients. Uh, and that that has been a very successful um, part. And Eva is actually part of. Eva, the host for today, uh, one of the hosts uh, for today, is part of a similar journey at a client today. Uh, then we have another thing, and this is the last thing uh, that I have. It's a virtual agent, and it's Freddy. And uh, as I told you guys, there, there is a lot of power in automation, which all of you probably know, but this is a kind of cool way of doing it. So they have this app you, uh, with Freddy, and it, it, what it does is that it, it, it automates simple tasks. It, it provides important reminders, not unimportant reminders, I might add. And then uh, it can respond, interact with people. Uh, so basically, uh, it's, it's, it takes down the administration time for the sales reps a lot. And of course, also increase sales. Um, the the promotion flow basically is like this: that you on you onboard the virtual agent. What you get is the late the, the Freddy provides you with the latest promotions that is uh, 
um, of in, maybe of interest to, to your customers. Um, then add an outlet. An outlet is a store in this case. And you see the appro receive a, an approval. Uh, and then you then create a visit. So uh, it automates an entire sales process. And, it, uh, and talking about before, uh, what is the easiest way, the low hanging fruits? Like, I mean, this is, this is a low hanging fruit in terms of, well, it's um, in terms of uh, how important it is and what it can provide. But it's not a low hanging fruit in terms of how much work it is and actually uh, change the entire way of working for a sales agent in this case. So there is a lot of education and communication going through this. And that is only one of the agent flows that we have in here. So we have one, so one thing that we call closing visits, which supports the sales representative uh, in, 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 uh, in closing the visits with the clients. Yeah, of course, get the order information and the payment proposal. Uh, and one thing that all sales reps hate is to update the master data or any, any updates with the client. That is done uh, much more automated today. That is actually all I have. And as uh, I just want to bear with you what Stephen Hawking has said, uh, it's all right to make mistakes. Nothing is perfect. And because with perfection, perfection, we would not exist. And I absolutely agree. Uh, fantastic man. And I thank you all so much. And I hope you will have a fantastic day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. That was really, really great. So now we have some questions here for you. But uh, before we do that, we can post a link to a survey your talk in the chat here. Yes. So we got some questions here. One moment here. Yeah, so one of the questions is this one. Oh, sorry. One of the questions is this one. So how much time uh, did it take from the ID to implement some of this in production for your clients? Like for example, this shelf recognition example that you had. Yeah, so the, the shelf recognition uh, it was, uh, I mean, first launched as a pilot, uh, but with a few sales reps involved. Uh, so they were heavily involved in going to clients. There was a client involved. Uh, so the, the the pilot was two and a half months, uh, and uh, and we are still working on the the, the implementation part of this. Uh, the implementation is done in Microsoft Azure uh, using different tools, as uh, as I mentioned, computer vision and so on, um, and this Power Virtual Agent that is used for for Freddy. Okay. Thank you. And then we have an another question here. In your opinion here or in your experiences, which industries are more interested in applying AI solutions? Um, yeah, so um, <clears throat> at this, at where we are today, I would say that all of them uh, are, <laughs> uh, but uh, looking historically uh, where we have, where it has been very low, uh, I would say, in in the financial sector and in uh, in healthcare, but both of them are really coming out of the starting blocks. And when I say the financial sector, I absolutely uh, don't count in uh, uh, um, scoring uh, as AI applications. Uh, I, I mean, they are they have. Both healthcare and and uh, uh, financial sector have both used uh, SaaS for many many years, or SPSs or something, and and uh, have had researches. So, um, but I, 
the, the most common ones, I mean, the, the, the ones that have come for, farthest, that are in the not so, so to say, uh, not legacy companies, uh, or, or is, um, uh, I would say, in auto, automotive uh, industry, uh, manufacturing in the industry. Um, and I'm not taking into account also RPA or anything like that when I talk about AI implementations. Uh, to me, it's it's absolutely something that's that has to be in there in the mix, but it's not an AI solution in my mind. And then I also have a comment or a question to you because you had a comment on Stefan's uh, presentation about the ability to detect um, uh, falling out of beds at hospitals and uh, about the return of investment. Can you can you say a little bit about that? Uh, about uh that uh, the return on investment on the ones I showed or the return on investment on his? No, I was thinking more of the return on investment on what he, he was talking about. Ah, was saying, yeah, mm. yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, he, at least in the North, it's not so many, um, <clears throat> there are not so many, you don't count lives in money uh, in terms of um, revenues. Um, so, uh, but you absolutely, I mean, um, the return on investment in ter when when it comes to healthcare is huge. Um, the fall falling out of beds, being able to detect that. Um, I mean, I did a quick Google search for it, and uh, so it's 14 billion Swedish crowns uh, per year, I think it was, and uh, uh, that the, which it costs society. So, I mean, <laughs> the ROI for that is, yeah, it's. It should be quite easy to to, to get uh, to to get that uh, budget through, if you ask me. But uh, politicians, uh, I'm not a politician. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I think we don't have any more questions here from from the audience. So then we will just take a small. Uh, maybe here is a question here. Yes, one more question. So the question is, in your experience, what is the key driver to boost digital transformation in the Nordics? Is it culture, technology, data, or other things? Uh, by boost digital transformation, um, um, do you mean to like uh, speed it up or? or I think I think it's meaning to increase the digital transformation or to increase the ah, yeah the, the velocity. I, I, I think that actually the biggest problem um, or, or one of them is that there is a huge lack of understanding of what it takes to become data driven in in senior management in the Nordics. Um, so there is an education that has to be in place for them. Or, or they can make room uh, for people that know what they're doing, um, uh, and also, but uh, and making room for people that know what they're doing. I mean, they could um, hire hire someone that knows what they're doing, uh, which they are. But then also, absolutely, they must provide uh, both budget and um, patience for that person in order to actually uh, come up with a with a good uh, strategy for them. Uh, today, I see a, a very a short uh, lack of, of patience. And um, uh, so um, there have, have been for several years, and um, how should I say, um, um, they're trying to take shortcuts. Um, I, I wouldn't say that, I mean, Adobe is a fantastic system, but I wouldn't say that Adobe is, is like the way to become data driven in terms of uh, for a marketing department in a big company. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's also, it's one, one piece of the puzzle, but it's, it's uh, an, an important piece, but it's, it's far from 
that. I, so to boost digital transformation, I would say that um, the, the senior management needs to understand better uh, what it actually is and uh, how much, it, uh, not how much it costs, because that varies, <laughs> but uh, th that it actually costs both time and money. So, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And what do you, what do you think? What is the most difficult challenge here? Is it more the technical aspects, or is it more the organizational aspects? I think there is a very fun uh, image of Pac-Man uh, on the internet uh, that uh, culture is eating. Uh, did, uh, what is? I don't remember what it says, but uh, and but it's true. I mean, culture is actually eating everything. So. Um, and what, that's why why I address that topic uh, of very early to start talking to to the business, start talking to uh, if the business is driving the engage the initiative, start talking to IT and so on, start engaging with each other, um, and and uh, if you have a data driven sales program going on, or uh, you have to really start talking to to the to, to all of them involved in sales to understand what this is it's not a cost cutting program it's a, it's a revenue program or whatever you want to what the what the message should be but it's super important yes yeah so let's see if there are any more questions here i don't see any more here so i think we can make a quick uh, transition here and then after the transition so stay on the line here because then we will be up for the panel debate so if you yeah. in the audience have any type of questions for any of our speakers so just uh, put them in in the chat and thank you once again peter for a very interesting presentation uh, thank you guys thank you everyone Yes. So then uh, you're on mute, actually. No. Hi. Yes. Like always. Uh, this is how I this is how I tune in all the time. I get started by being muted. But I'm so happy to be back. Uh, we heard some awesome sessions today. Um, I would really like to hear from the audience which one was your most inspiring one for your uh, opinion. In your opinion. And um, let's see. I think we could uh, get started with questions, right? So um, uh, we also wait for questions from the audience. And we also have some questions for you prepared already. <laughs> so should I go ahead with the first one? Yes. So what is the biggest challenge for putting machine learning into production? Anyone can answer. Uh all right. Um, the the biggest uh, there are several. The the biggest uh, is 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 different from company to company. Uh, if you, for instance, use Python uh, and you don't have anyone in the client that knows Python, <laughs> uh, that could be a great challenge. Um, you know what I mean, Eva? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, but but then, um, if you have a if you have made your pilot, for instance, in in uh, in in uh, if you've used Google for for your pilot and you your IT department loves Microsoft, then you have a problem as well. So it's it's different from company to company, I would say. What do you guys say, Stefan, Goran, Kosia? Yeah, I would I would agree. Like uh, some some. Um, things like that also proving proving that things work right and that actual results will come out and uh yeah that could be that could be a challenge actually developing something like development time can be can be long until you you get some uh, yeah results accuracy what you aim for to to be able to get it to to the real system to help out there 
and it's about how to have the systems of something that were on till it's strange ways. <laughs> wow, and you sound like a robot here. Did you switch oh. to your artificial intelligence? <laughs> maybe, maybe if you have just a headset somewhere, Stefan, and you can try that. No. <laughs> no. Still, it's still very robotic. Yes. Not getting better. But you're from maybe. Norway, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we yes, can uh, we can take the say uh, another question here in the meantime maybe so uh, another question here is in um, your experience uh, in your experience what do you spend most of your time on in a machine learning project is it on the data analysis part or is it tuning of the machine learning algorithms or is that is it actually more the software part getting this api to to work I would say it's always cleaning the data and so yeah, yeah. <laughs> like uh, I think Peter you uh, mentioned the uh, Pacman so, uh, somewhere or something like that and for me those projects are always like you know those data data and just <laughs> feeding it in yeah, stuff on this back yeah. so hopefully connection works am I still sounding like a robot no no you sound you awesome now <laughs> okay I, I thought you would actually say, Peter, that uh, that uh, longest time it takes to to get a good understanding of uh, what do we use machine learning for, actually. Uh, not on our side, but on but you know uh, during the conversation with the client sometimes. Usually that is not the case. Uh, I know what project you are referring to, Eva, but usually I don't see that is the case. Uh, but uh, I, I'm very much uh, is in line is in line with what Goran said. I mean, cleaning the data, get the data, um, understanding the data, all of those things are. Mo the, the what takes most time it's it's a very actually very similar in terms of 80 20 rule uh, for a bi project uh, so uh, usually but the th the, the a, a big um a, a big difference is the bias thing in in terms of machine learning uh because in a BI project, you don't have, or we're looking at data and data quality, you don't have to take that into account. Um, but in a in a machine learning project, you really have to take that into account because otherwise you will get very skewed results uh, and output, and a little bit depending on what you're doing. Uh, predicting a maintenance fault, of course, is, doesn't matter so much, but. Um, Yes. And Stefan, do you have any comments? So the question was where you spend most of the time in the machine learning project. Is it in the data analysis part or is it tuning of machine learning algorithms or is it to more on the software part getting the API to work? Uh, definitely the data data side. Um, yeah. Definitely, yeah. Uh, and I mean, it's on multiple levels. It's uh, if we have existing data sets, then it's uh, getting those data sets. If we are working as consultants, it's cleaning it, understanding it. Uh, if we're building data from the scratch, it's building the systems to collect the data. But uh, I mean, uh, unfortunately for us, but luckily for our clients, a lot of the value is just getting out the data, stress testing the data, getting the basic insights um that's where a lot of the value is and uh, typically the clients are that's their maturity level and uh, it's also easy to deliver value on that uh, and it's easy to build something that will last and that can uh, survive when the consultants leave uh, and it happens time after time i uh, I bring a single variable uh, plot uh, into the steering committee, and we spend uh, 10 minutes talking about that. 
<laughs> and uh, yes, they they think my model was nice and all, but that single variable that suddenly triggered an initiative. So yeah, we're, we're still early. Uh, yeah, I, I I must say something that is quite funny. I once uh, had a I mean understanding the result and the output from 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 a model can be hard and tricky for someone that ha is not used to, to looking at data in that way or, or, or understanding it. Um, so uh, I, I had a client once, so like, he's like, so is this, uh, we, we present a confusion matrix. And so is this good or bad? Should we go or not? And I, I kind of had like, I, I had come out, I didn't have any words left to to try to explain this, so I basically said, and he's what he was he was the vice president of the company, like um, a deputy CEO. Sorry, and I, I had to say to him, like, if you don't proceed here, I would actually say you're quite stupid. So, based on that, how did you convince your customers to use machine learning? Well, tell them that they're stupid, of course, if they don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I, I, I feel I talk too much here, but um, um, today I would say we don't have to convince them to use machine learning so much. Uh, we have to you basically convince them to work with us rather than Stratitech uh, <laughs> or in Meta. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, because Today, you can actually read about uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning in the daily newspaper. Um, everyone knows that we need to work on that, but they don't know how um, so, uh, or, or what to look for. Uh, so that's not a problem usually, or at least not that I feel. I think that there's that part where uh we need to inspire the clients and uh, give them some some idea what is possible because they do know AI, machine learning, those things are there, right? But how that can benefit their business and what can actually, what value, business value it brings at uh, the end of the day, right? Why should they invest uh, in those projects? And uh, especially, uh, as we said, as a consultant, it's always important also to to estimate. And for those things, sometimes it's not not easy to estimate. Okay, how long will it take to to get some result out of uh, out of the whole thing? So, just inspiring them and giving them idea. Okay, those are possibilities. And then once they are down the that road, they can figure out. Uh, okay, now we are getting these results. We can get something else out of it and. Uh, Right than there. Uh, first step to actually get the go is the hardest one. Uh, at least that's my opinion. Like uh, for them to to have courage to to start, and afterwards, uh, yeah, it's it's easier. So that inspiring part is important. I would say. And maybe for you, Stefan, it's not easy to convince like, okay, we should install this in the hospital, right? Like in a, why should some hospital put it in a room? Like uh, just to, yeah. for you to collect the data first to be able to show the results and uh, yeah. Yeah, because we are, we are in this situation, uh, of course, there's huge ROI if you start from scratch. But uh, we are not the first ones doing this. There are other technologies out there, other vendors promising stuff. Uh, we we need to show that we're better than state of the art, uh, and and that's that's basically uh, how I uh, when I deliver or build machine learning models. Uh, typically, I start okay. Here is a problem. Here is how I can evaluate the the value of a solution. What happens if I randomly guess? How much money are we making or losing? OK, that's one benchmark. Second one, what, what if I spend half a day writing a SQL query? What, what's the value of that? What's the value of me spending one more day and then putting, putting this data into AutoML? Uh, yes, you're going to spend a lot of cloud money, but that's a lot cheaper than uh, consulting uh, money. 
And then, uh, okay, um, building something custom on top of that, what, what is the additional value? Um, sometimes you stop at that simple SQL statement. Sometimes even that perfect model does not make business sense. So it's all, always uh, like benchmarking against something. Yes, um, and I think somehow uh, I just got some connection into my next question. So because we were talking about that, that uh, that what is the aim? Uh, what do we want to what do we want to change while uh, using machine learning solutions? So, you know what I want to ask? Like, what kind of projects your customers uh, want uh, want to use machine learning for? For example, I mean, uh, what what is you know the kind of project like is it for for uh, more like a, a revenue increase uh, is it for so you know what is the what is the type of project that uh, they are usually coming to you saying that um, okay we want to do this and this because we want to reach this and that or we want to achieve this and that maybe I can give one interesting like example here uh, we work a lot with uh, public transport uh, vertical and uh, somewhere beginning of the year uh, there was a solution developed to uh, make predictions for the uh, bus and trains occupancy public transport occupancy and uh, it's widely used right when you want to buy a ticket you see or you search for the next next route you see how much uh, predictions how much it will be uh, it will be uh, crowded yeah <laughs> that's the word i'm looking for so as an example from one vertical right yeah so <clears throat> i think um, if the question is what 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 are the type of applications that the clients are looking for in the beginning, or uh, it, it's also extremely different depending on what type of um, industry they're in. I would say, uh, looking at the manufacturing industry, they usually look at the uh, manufacturing uh, process, or uh, or maybe the the uh, um, maybe predictive uh, maintenance the word you were looking for yeah that, yeah that's one part of it yes uh and the supply chain process oh, yeah. uh, so in order to optimize the supply chain or or get a better overview of it um and and the, the predictive maintenance has been around for forever almost so so very common in in uh, in the manufacturing business um uh, but in in looking at so if we look at consumers consumer uh, b business to consumer related companies they usually have a strong tendency i would say to to lean towards customer analytics of of many different kinds but um upsell is one for instance mm -hmm. um if you look at um, clients that have like millions of uh, customers that have like mil millions of clients, like a mobile operator or something, uh, churn is you know, you know different uh, different churn models um, and so on. Uh, so customer, yes, but and it varies from industry to industry. In healthcare, it's not so much predictive maintenance. Yes, however, but it I would think... be great. It it, go, yeah. it, it absolutely can apply. And I agree because uh, that's that's what uh, what I had in my head as well that uh, that maybe this uh, can be understood like that that maybe okay like in in healthcare maybe we more interested in looking into solutions like uh, you know the the uh, convolutional neural network or like uh, do some some like uh, I don't know what what else I just my brain is so full with all the stories you were coming up with and I would just repeat the stories you said before so so yeah but you know what I mean uh, Stefan do you have uh, something to add 
Um, yeah, so I really agree on, um, there are a couple of ways you could provide the value with uh, machine learning. One of them is you, you have a process where there is a lot of revenue going through. There's a lot of value in like mar marginally improving that 1%. That's, uh, that's like, that's probably because, uh, Google is, uh, investing so much like, uh, improving ad efficiency 1%, uh, that's a lot of money. Uh, but, but you also have, uh, totally different things that were not possible before. So for instance, uh, like CNNs and image analysis that opens up totally new things, language, uh, language models in the last couple of years have gotten really impressive. And that opens up for new new things that uh, we haven't seen before. So it, it's a combination of uh, adding a couple of percent somewhere uh, and doing totally new things. Nice. We actually have a question here from the audience. So it's Gabriel. He asks, from your presentations, I see a lot of connection between IoT and real world machine learning. Do you see this as a racing trend for the industry? Well, IoT is more and more like it's here for some time and uh, things are more and more connected. There are more and more sensors and uh, what I showed like with this Percept device that Microsoft just released, I think this uh, AI stuff is going to edge a lot in the next few years and everything will be not everything, a lot of things will be distributed to to be able to to react exactly there on that spot and uh, performing specific action. So I do see this uh, as a uh, yeah, big thing in in uh, future AI on edge. Yeah, uh, I also just, uh, absolutely. Uh, to me, I, uh, I, IoT is there to provide data, uh, and then you use machine learning and AI technology to to derive insight from that. Um, and uh, what Percept and and uh, edge devices add to the, the the mix here is the ability, I mean, to work wherever and uh, get that uh, combination. Uh, wherever you are this with or even without having uh, um, an internet connection um, you know you could be uh, very far outside of the outside of the grid uh, having a chainsaw cutting down a tree and uh, get uh, and get um, a, a notification telling that uh, the chainsaw will will probably break. <laughs> In a, in a while. Um, so I think that uh, it's a very good question. And I absolutely think uh, that it's not a, just a trend. It's, uh, it's, um, it's, it's the way it's, it's the way to go. Uh, we are also very lucky with uh, hardware developments. So yeah. these uh, three, 3D cameras, uh, they were a couple of hundred dollars uh, some years ago. Now uh, you can buy them on AliExpress for a couple tens of dollars. Uh, LiDARs were things on self-driving cars that were very expensive. Now there are startups building them for like thousand dollar, hundred dollar. So radars as well. Uh, lo lots of new tools coming out there. Definitely, and I think like uh, it's great to see that this uh, do-it-yourself uh, community enthusiasts out there are, uh, you know, they they uh, trying out stuff, and basically a lot of innovation lives there, right? Just uh, and uh, yeah, a lot of sensors like they're super cheap and uh, out there, and uh, it's uh, it's really. Uh, really great and it's also really helps that uh, there's so much managed tooling coming out so let's say you're an embedded developer okay you know how to work with these devices but you probably don't know machine learning 
okay, you have managed machine learning to get something out. And the same way, uh, when I as a data scientist, I, I know machine learning, but I'm not good with IoT. So I have someone to hold my hand there with the product. It allows me to get something out. And uh, if it works, we can invest more in it, and then we'll move away to something more custom. But it allows us to demonstrate value quickly, cheaply, and then scale from there. Yeah, so we have a last question for today, again from Gabriel. So the question is, what are your thoughts about TidyML and TensorFlow Lite? Is this something your companies are interested to explore to bring value to customers? Stefan, maybe you can start. Yeah, I guess um, it's very interesting, this trend in uh, compressing models to save on uh, compute. Uh, and it's definitely needed in order to run more and more uh, demanding stuff on the edge. Uh, I believe we're going to see more and more products in uh, mobiles and also battery connected devices and uh, power consumption is very important. And typically, we see that in uh, ML, there's this trend of someone does something with like either an innovative use case or massive gain in improvements. They do it by like having deeper network, much more data, much more parameters. So that's like one thing. And then for the next couple of years, people are getting the same performance with lighter and lighter models. Uh, so that, that's what we saw with CNNs, like the, the first VGG networks. They were impressive, but they were huge. And then, then we've seen re, uh, like uh, research continue with, can I improve things a bit more with huge networks? And can I have the same performance or better with smaller networks? Um, and also, can I train my model with a lot of data in advance and then save uh, on compute when I do inference. So it's definitely a focus uh, focus on conserving compute, conserving uh, memory consumption. Yes, uh, I, I, I completely agree with you, Stefan. Uh, just to add to that, I would, um, in my mind, it's, it's um, w w uh, as IoT is expanding and uh, we as uh, people also um, get more acquainted and used to uh, measure things because we are getting more and more used to that, um, not only in the workplace, but actually of the workplace in our private lives. I think, I think you will see this kind of technology um, grow into watches, um, mobile phones, uh, I think actually uh, shoes, um, for instance, maybe even clothes, clothing, uh, and a lot of different other stuff. Um, so I, I think it, there is a, probably a whole new economy that will maybe if I just, you know, kind of spin in my head, our economy start will start to grow from uh, from that, um, or an ecosystem on new types of services, at least. Goran, do you want to comment on this? I fully agree. And like, um, question was, uh, like the second part, uh, would be, um, would it be interesting to explore, to bring value to, to customers? I, I think that that's the point, right? If it brings value, if it can bring value to, to customers, then of course this should be explored and uh, checked like uh, what can be, what can be uh, done with it and uh, how much value it brings. Yes, well, I, I am very happy that we could talk about so many things today. I actually learned a lot from you guys. Um, 
and then I, I heard a lot of new things, for example, that I was uh, not aware of. So it was really awesome to, to hear all these things from you. So I am very happy that uh, we could host you, all of you. So thank you for tonight. Um, I think with that, I'm going to wrap up for tonight. Um, so because somehow these few hours just happened in like two minutes, but we've seen a lot of interesting topics and amazing speakers. And your journey doesn't have to end here. You can continue learning with the Cloud Skills Challenge until 10 a.m. on the 24th of September and be the lucky winner of one of the free AI42 swag boxes. And the cool thing actually about this skill challenge is that you will see a real life um, application of artificial intelligence and machine learning by practicing through the steps of what NASA is doing while they're analyzing uh, the moonstones and, and a lot more things that are very interesting. So I really think it's a good idea to look into this challenge. And then the winner is going to be picked on the 25th of September. Um, and you can review the winner's list on our web page, which is going to be shared as well later on. So thank you all for joining us. Hope you had a great time with the AI42 team. And as our gratitude, please take our Azure Heroes badges with the help of this QR code. And we also hope to see you soon at our next event that is going to go on every second week on Wednesday until the end of the year. And we really hope to see you again soon. And with all that, I thank you again to all our speakers for the amazing night tonight and to our ad audience and to our speakers and to our hosts again. Wish you all a great evening and thank you for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye.